Thank you for being here today. It's a great day. Busy place, guys. Always a fun time of the year. What comes to mind for you when hockey season rolls around finally? You, you know, in today's world, hockey season never really goes away. The games stop. The, the games stop, but the business and the energy and that stuff doesn't stop. Just, just the games stop. So they're back on the ice. That makes it seem more like hockey season to everybody else. It never really stops. It's more of a 12-month-of-the-year thing now for, for the coaches, the trainers, the managers. It, just, it doesn't really stop. Is there something special for you, though, when you get a chance to come in and see the people who support the team so well and around the team all the time? Yeah, you run into the same people all, almost every year. So, um, you know, unless you see them in the summertime, you, you come to an event like this and you can catch up on, on, uh, on people's summers and more importantly, catch up on their opinion of what you need to do. Pascal Vincent with us as well, head coach of the Manitoba Moose. Last year, returning to the head coaching role after five years with the Winnipeg Jets, a very experienced head coach in the Quebec Major Junior Hockey League prior to that time. And uh, Pascal, I'm going to start with you and, and just ask about how important the summer is for you in terms of recharging your batteries and getting ready to go for another year? Well, it's, it's a long season. Uh, you go from this time of the year till the end of the season and you don't stop. You work seven days a week. Um, it's important. It's important physically. It's important mentally to recharge um, and, and to go back after a season and reflect on what happened so you can improve in the summer. So there's, there's a lot of things you can accomplish in the summer. But one of them is to recharge. Absolutely. And we'll talk more about that in just a little bit. But I wanted to ask you, Craig, before we go too much further, just about last season and the Manitoba Moose and maybe the development of some of the players, just your overall sense of how things went a year ago as the team improved points-wise from the previous season. Yeah, the, the team improved points-wise. Um, I mean, I'm not sure overall the wins and losses did, but it's interesting. We sort of had a change in philosophy of, of how we've measured success at the American League level. I know we all felt really good that Nelson Noje went up and played 20 games very successfully at the end of the season. And that, unfortunately, I guess that doesn't happen if you have four depth defensemen ahead of him. The fact that he had, he got those 20 minutes a night just about no matter what in the American League and, and lots of quality reps and practice makes that transition a lot easier, especially for a first-year player. I think it was evident the year before uh, that Josh Morrissey, what the number of minutes that he got in the American League and what, what transition last year. He played every exhibition game for the Jets and every game all season and was one of the most reliable players all year. And you have to get that, you have to get those minutes in the American League to have that success. I think we'd like to do a better job of moving the line in the sand a little bit closer to the, the win-loss side versus just the development side. In the Vancouver days, we probably had the line way too far over on the win-loss side and probably didn't do as good a job as we could have done for Vancouver. We've done a much better job um, as the, parent, as the uh, affiliate for the Winnipeg Jets. But 100% of culture isn't dictated by winning and losing, but we'd like to move that line a little bit anyway. 12 players played with both the Moose and the Jets last season, a sign of the way the club is developing its young players. And I know, Pascal, that's a big priority for you. You've said to me many times when we talk about the team, it's about developing players and developing that winning culture. What was it like for you to get behind the bench again and be that head coach and, and steer that ship on a day-to-day -day basis, helping the players get better, trying to win games as well? Well, the biggest adjustment for me was five years ago when I had to become an assistant coach. Um, going back as a head coach and the staff that we have um, and the background that we have as an organization and knowing that we would use the same systems, uh, same kind of words we use in the dressing rooms um, and how we address the players, same management. Um, the adjustment wasn't really that big and we had uh, Mark Morrison as an assistant coach now that he's... Uh, he made the move to the NHL, and uh, we're really happy for him. But we had him, and he had tons of experience in the American League. So that was helping as well. And, uh, and um, the leadership group of our team has been pretty good. So that was also helping for uh, the transition. But as far as myself is concerned, it wasn't a big transition. Just getting to know the league, um, getting to know um, how we travel, how the players respond. And I, I didn't appreciate 
and I said that last night, I didn't appreciate how good that league was. It's a really good league. And the gap between the American League and the NHL, there's a gap, but it's not that big. The, ga the bigger gap is coming from junior or college hockey, moving up to the pro level. So it was a good, uh, it was a good season as far as I, as I am concerned, understanding what it takes. Um, and, and we feel it's going to get better and better. So is there something from the experience, now that you know the league better, you understand the grind of the league a little bit more, uh, that you're thinking about as a priority coming into this season? Something that you've taken from that experience? Well, there's, you learn every year. And then what we do in the summer is um, um, we meet and we talk quite a bit. I, I speak with Paul quite a bit, the coaching staff. We, we communicate. We're like a big coaching staff, the Jets and the Moose. We, we, we're in touch consistently. And, and there's, there's always things that we learn from the past. Um, and, and moving forward, it's the American League and, and Zinger has way more experience than I do at that level. But it's, the player turnover is outstanding. Uh, there's, it's consistently changing. There's an injury with the Jets. It's going to affect our team. And when we get an injury on top of that, then it's two new players that we have to there, there's a lot of movement, so it's, uh, but there's always a better way to do things, and, and that's what we're trying to do. Well, Singer, speaking of that subject that Pascal just brought up, uh, I wanted to ask you, people might wonder, do you plan a Jets team and plan a Moose team, or is it all kind of a Jets trickle down with everything being part of a larger frame? How do you approach the two clubs? Well, actually, it's three clubs, because right. a big factor in the American League is how good a job you do with your ECHL team, of signing depth American League contracts, or even if they're not on ECH or American League two-way contracts, that you have good players where your ECHL affiliate is is located. This year, our ECHL affiliated is in Jacksonville, Florida, and apparently Jacksonville is still in Florida, so that's a good thing. Yeah. Um, uh, Jason Christie, our ECHL coach, will be up here next week for the start of Moose Camp. So. Things evolve from the Jets side and, and you do you react to what happens on the NHL side, but you need to be proactive from the um, ECHL side and make sure that you know the players. We have a, we have a full-time scout basically that p pays attention to the ECHL, Bruce Southern, and we have a really good book on the good young players that are just straight East Coast League contracts. But as years go by, you, you identify different players that you'd like to have on a two-way contract you know, for instance, Tim Daly played a game for us last year. We liked what we saw, so we, we put him on a two-way contract. Um, Elgin Pierce comes up and plays a few games last year. He goes on a two-way contract. Francis Bovier came in last year from the CIS. He played really well for us. We think he's still a decent prospect, so he's on an AHL one-way contract. But the I guess the, what I said was that the, the, jet, the jet stuff is, is reactionary. The ECHL stuff is reactionary. We're the team in the middle, and we have to make it work. It's an interesting situation, a challenging one. I know you talked about it last year and, and got comfortable with it over the course of the season. You mentioned Mark Morrison earlier, and I wanted to go back to that. Uh, an experienced coach, a guy who was a, a big help to you, a big help to the organization. He moves on to the Anaheim Ducks. Marty Johnston has chosen to come in in his place. Just a brief thought on what Mark contributed and, and having Marty part of the group now. Well, Mark, Mark did a lot. It, it started a while ago. I think the relationship between him and, and Craig was uh, its coming from a, a while ago. And, and, and the way he conducted himself around the players uh, and his experience and the way he was able to connect with the players and, and different generations, because you have different age groups on, on your team, um, his ability to stay in the moment and to stay focused on, on what needs to be done um, at the moment was really good. And then his, his people skills, social skills were so good. Um, they're still good. That's why that brought him. He, he's really good at that. And then that brought him to the NHL and, and good for him. It well deserved. Marty will bring um, a new voice. He will bring a new background. He will bring a new experience. Um, he's excited about the experience. Uh, he's the one thing we were looking for when, because we have received quite a few resumes, was uh, make sure we find the right people. 
and um, especially when we were looking for free agents or, or players were looking for the right people same thing for an assistant coach we're looking for the right people and Marty was that kind of person and and we do a lot of calls and, and we do our homeworks and and we called a lot of people and um, good feedback a lot of good feedbacks coming uh, his way so um, when we interviewed so we had a lot of resumes a lot of phone calls um, a lot of interviews on the phone and we trimmed it down to two people Marty was one of them and um, and it was pretty good in the interview we sat down and we decided to to go with him he's a young guy he's played the game he's a, he's a character person and uh, uh, lots of uh, success in the past offensively the power play that he's been coaching so that will be one area that he'll be doing the offensive side of the game and he's fitting exactly uh, the kind of he's exactly the kind of person we were looking for and uh, that fits the true north mentality so um, he checked all the boxes and, and and to replace Mark Morrison that's a big thing and we're not looking for a new Mark Morrison we're looking for a new person that will do pretty much the same job Marty Johnston talking about the impact that Claude Julian had on his career when he played junior for Claude. He's been a bit of a mentor for him over the years. A, a great example for any young coach to learn from somebody like that. Well, I know one of the questions you get all the time, uh, Zinger, is uh, you know, tell us about the young prospects and how they're coming along. When you looked at this uh, Moose team last season and names like Connor and Roslovic and Comrie come up, what comes to mind for you? Well, the number one thing that comes to mind is because you say this all the time to young players, is if they get sent down from the, uh, the NHL team, it's like go down to the American League and dominate. And we, it's kind of cliche us, and we say it far too often, but after Kyle Connor accepted um, being sent down to Manitoba and that the Moose were gonna be his team for the rest of the year, his ability to dominate the American Hockey League was can't tell you that that's something I've seen a young player be able to do as well as he, as he did. And it's, it's really become evident at this training camp this year that it wasn't just this play that opened up. His personality and his demeanor has really opened up a tremendous amount. I don't think people truly understand the, the value of embracing when you do get sent down that it's part of the process. You miss too many you miss too many lessons if you just start at the top. You, your ability to make mistakes and learn from those mistakes happen in the ECHL, they happen in the American League. And then when you get to the National Hockey League, you know how to react when those mistakes happen. But that's one of the things that stands out for me. The other one that stands out for me, and I usually don't speak about individual players, but in this forum it's probably okay, was Jack Roslevic. And Jack was a unique situation last year because he would have been the only player of the 60 that were invited to camp that was happy to get sent down to Manitoba because that was his goal. He was an unrealistic goal to think that he was going to play for the Jets. He just didn't want to get sent back to London. So this year, it will be an interesting curve. And it's not just about the player. It's what we as management and coaches learn how the players react as well. But it will be interesting to see how Jack reacts if if things don't go his way at the National Hockey League level because his mentality is totally different this year. So those, those are the, the two things that I think stand out to me most and they sort of go from one year to the next. As much as the American League is transient, as, as Pazzi said, there are constants and, and, and those are two of them. You know, Pascal, when I think about what Zinger is saying there, I think about you and your coaches, your staff, because you're the ones who have to try and deal with the players who come in from all different head spaces, guys who are pleased to be there, guys who are not so pleased to be there. And I think that's something you take pride in. I don't want to speak for you, but it seems to me that you like to get to know those players on an individual basis. Tell us a little bit about how important that is for you in helping that player and in helping the team to come together. Well, it's important to me, but it's important to the organization that we get to know those players. We, we, we don't coach hockey players, we coach people. And if we can coach the people right, then the hockey player will be fine. So it's getting to know those players, and then it starts at the draft. They do a great job at interviewing the players. They know their background, their family background. They know everything is known in today's world, but we, we push it a bit further to get to know them, how they react when they're facing adversity, 
how they react when they're being sent down to the moose. Um, not only on that day, but the, the day after and the week after. Um, how do they practice? How do they face adversity during the games if things don't work their way? So it's, it's getting to know them. Know them. It's a lot of um, observations, a lot of uh, time sitting in the office and talking to them, but it's it, at the same time, it could not be possible without assistant coaches. And those guys, that's a big part of their job is to get to know them and spend a lot of time talking to them and, and, and trying to understand their point of view. It it's, would be easy for us or easier for us to just tell them what to do, but to understand where they're coming from, why they've made those choices on and off the ice, and to guide them uh, to reach what their dreams, which is to play for the Winnipeg Jets in the NHL. So it, it's really important because, uh, as I said earlier, we're coaching people, uh, and the hockey player will, it's, it's secondary to what we do. You know, when I think about coaching people and trying to get people to reach their potential and, and to try and have the right approach to things, I think about the emphasis you've always placed, Singer, on having the team make a connection to the community. This goes right back to the very first days of the Manitoba Moose. Talk about why that's the case, why you've made that a priority right from the beginning. Well, it's always been, it was a priority back. It, it, it evolved into the to the Moose 1.0, but it started with Jets 1.0. Like, it was always a priority when when uh, Barry Shankro and his family owned the team, the Wives Carnival, the Pancake Breakfast, all those things. And, and back then, it was a lot easier to connect with the players to a certain degree than it is today. But that's one thing about the American League is the ability for the, that level of player to connect with the community. And it was important in the, the, the 15 years when when the Jets 1.0 left till Jets 2.0 returned. I mean, the fact of the matter is, all the things that we tried to build on for those 15 years, in my opinion, is not only the number one reason, the only reason that the Jets returned in 2.0 was the foundation built in those days. And that foundation started with the people. And I, I can't remember what the percentage of renewals were when the Jet season tickets went uh, for 2.0, but a large percentage of them and, and first dibs on them was to those Moose season ticket holders. So that's the foundation. I mean, there's, there's two things that are the lifeline of your team and in no particular order. If you don't have players, you don't have a team. And if you don't have passionate fans, you don't have a team. Absolutely. There's no question about that. We appreciate you being here today as always. It's very important to be able to get a chance to connect and see you guys face to face. Thank you so much for taking the time. Pascal, uh, I wanted to ask you about uh, advice for young coaches. I know that you often run into people who are interested in working with their kids or helping out in their neighborhoods with the, the teams that are around their place where they live. What kinds of things do you suggest for young coaches in terms of being able to help with the teams and the kids that they work with? There's no school for coaching. There's, you can't go to school and say, okay, I have my degree as a coach. So it's, you need to learn how to self-educate yourself. And, and that's, that's working hard, obviously. You need to watch a lot of video, understanding the game. You need to talk to a lot of people, ask people, uh, what they think, uh, trying to get some mentors, I, would, uh, I should say. Um, find, find a way to find a way to get better by asking questions, by learning. And, and you have, once you start coaching, you have to put your ego on the side and, and really be honest about what's in front of you. Because um, you don't know it all. And, and that's the cue, the, the, the key. The, the day that you start thinking that you know it all, that's, that's it, you're done. So it's um, young coaches is a lot of reading, a lot of watching, uh, a lot of questions. And, and um, the one thing I did quite a bit when I was in junior and midget was watching a lot of NHL games and, and taking notes on how they play and trying to find out the tendencies of the coaches back then, why they were having those matchups. And, and trying to figure out what I would do myself against that team or against that kind of system. Uh, and then again, 
trying to find ways on how to practice those systems and, and making drills in my mind. So it's, it's a lot of work, um, but everybody works hard. And, and if you want to make it as a coach, it's, uh, you'll have to, to it's, it's a passion, first of all. You need that passion because to put those hours week after week after week, it's, it's, it's going uh, to be deep inside and it's going to be a real passion. So um, a lot of things, but um, it's, the foundation's got to be hard work. Well, you mentioned hard work, you mentioned passion as well. And Zinger, I know something that's become a, a real passion of yours is talking about the importance of, of mental health, taking care of your mental health as much as your physical health. Project 11, near and dear to your heart. In fact, you're wearing the top with the number 11 over your heart right now. What can you tell us about that program and how it's come along and, and what it means to you to be able to contribute to Manitoba, not just Winnipeg in that way? Well, Project 11 was a... Was a project created in memory of Rick Rippon, who was a Manitoba Moose player that graduated to the Vancouver Canucks and was uh, re-signed with uh, the Jets when they came back before uh, his untimely passing in August of uh, 2011. It's turned out to be a wonderful program. We're in over 400 classrooms across Manitoba. We get countless, uh, countless requests to speak. Um, I personally speak two to three schools a month, so you know, up to 36 high schools or, or, or grade schools a year. Just came back from Thompson yesterday where we, we spoke to 800 students in, in the northern Manitoba between Thompson, Lynn Lake, Cross Lake, Split Lake. Um, so there's a lot of interest in the program. There's a lot of need for the program. And when Rick was struggling with his mental illness and depression and he was on his way to recovery, this was a passion of his to be able to help younger kids deal with what he felt he had to deal with in middle school and high school. And it's just been incumbent upon us. He did so much in this community while he was with us. It's been incumbent upon us to try to carry on what his vision was. And to this point, I think we've done a pretty good job of it. But it's, it, it, it's not like it's ever going to hit a stage where it's complete. It's ongoing. We're always learning, but it also takes the other half of people to be interested. And certainly the, 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 the teachers in the province of Manitoba have been phenomenal about learning about the program and in integrating it into their classroom. Well, a very important program. We appreciate you taking the time to share some information about it today. We appreciate the time for both of you gentlemen this afternoon. That's it for this session. But thank you so much for listening in and being part of it. And we look forward to seeing you around the rink in the seasons ahead. All the best. <laughs>